Welcome back to the Flying Moose. Last week, Delta Airlines did this. This expansion comes just a few months after Germany's Deutsche Bahn Railway joined Star Lines, which is an airline alliance. So you might be wondering, what's with all the trains? Well, that's exactly what this video is about. We're talking about something that can fundamentally change the way we travel. Air rail alliances. This concept isn't revolutionary, and it's not even particularly new, but it's something that we haven't seen much of in North America, maybe because we're allergic to having adequate passenger rail infrastructure. I find this topic fascinating and think we need more of it, so I'll try and do it justice. We'll first describe what this is so we're on the same page for the rest of the video. We'll then look at key benefits of these alliances, and finally, we'll explore both existing and hypothetical environments where this concept can work well. By the end of this, hopefully you'll be as excited about this as I am. Before we get into the details, I'll explain this concept with an example. Imagine you're trying to go from Toronto to Dusseldorf. There isn't a direct flight, so you connect through Frankfurt. Nothing out of the ordinary here. You fly from Toronto to Frankfurt, but then the trip to Dusseldorf is on a high-speed train. You're a little skeptical when you get to Frankfurt, but the station is literally right there. You use the same Lufthansa ticket to board the train, and you have a reserved seat. You end up in the city center much sooner than you would have otherwise if you had to fly an A319 on that 200km route. There are three main types of air rail alliances. Dedicated services, entire network access, and night and fly. Dedicated services are the highest level of integration, where the entire journey feels like an airline trip, even if some sections are by rail. You only have to check your bag once, the train has reserved seating, and even refreshments are sometimes provided. It essentially makes your travel experience medium agnostic, but it does require the most investment. There are immense upfront costs with infrastructure like rail connections to airports, and high operating costs for services like security and baggage control in downtown train stations. Lufthansa has been running dedicated services for a while now under their express rail arm in partnership with Deutsche Bahn, with many routes extending outward from Frankfurt Airport. Entire network access is a step below this, where passengers can get discounted rail tickets from their airline destination. It really is just booking separate plane and train tickets as you would otherwise, but with a discount and some additional support. There's no integration with security or anything. Passengers generally have access to the entire network, hence the name. Two examples of this are the rail and fly branding by Deutsche Bahn and Austria's OBB. Night and fly is different in that it's an open jaw arrangement. Round trips are conducted with a flight in one direction and rail in the other. The rail portion lends itself well to overnight legs, where it might actually be more desirable to sleep on a longer train ride than a shorter flight. This is simpler to operate because airlines and rail operators remain independent in their operations, and neither has to worry about the complexities of coordinating same-day switches. Despite the benefits, this model has seen the lowest adoption, likely due to the small number of markets with sufficient business travel and rail capabilities. We're covering the concept of air rail alliances as a whole, so the differentiation between each type doesn't matter that much, but it's still nice to understand the specifics of each type, especially if you engage with the topic further. Now comes the big question, why do this at all? Why would you listen to me, a 22 year old on YouTube, tell you that this air rail thing is good for people? Well, we'll look at it through the lens of each group that'll interact with the concept, namely the passengers, the airlines or operators, and the natural environment. And then we'll see how it'll benefit each of those groups. Passengers mainly benefit in three ways, convenience, comfort, and flexibility. Flying unfortunately wastes a huge amount of productive time. You have to commute to and from airports, wait at the airport, wait for the plane to reach 10,000 feet, wait to connect to the Wi-Fi before realizing that none of Air Canada's 737s actually have Wi-Fi for some reason. Via Rail has a helpful graphic to illustrate this, because on a train, you can start working immediately when you get on. The sweet spot for high-speed rail tends to be replacing flights that are around 1 hour or 400 kilometers long as the dead time of airports means that an equivalent train journey actually isn't that much longer, but gives you far more productive time. I'll repeat this in case it wasn't clear. On flights of around 4 to 500 kilometers, you almost always would rather take a high-speed train. Comfort largely comes from the fact that trains are more comfortable than planes, 
especially newer high-speed rail. It's always hard to quantify, but studies and the internet have come to the consensus that rail beats air, especially in economy for comfort. And trains aren't just replacing any planes, they're primarily replacing regional jets that are notoriously uncomfortable. It doesn't matter if you're super elite, getting into a CRJ just isn't a good time. The rail portion of these alliances naturally handles segments of several hundred kilometers, obviating the need for short hops on aging ERJs, CRJs, and dash aids. Finally, flexibility is a huge benefit because it opens up more destinations and schedule options for passengers. Brightline in Florida is an example, and we'll definitely get to this in more depth later, but an airline like Air Canada can provide much more network flexibility by code sharing with a rail operator like Brightline. Instead of having to operate separate flights from Toronto to Orlando or Miami, Air Canada can rely on Brightline to connect Orlando International Airport with other cities in Florida. Passengers like you and me can therefore reach destinations like Fort Lauderdale while still flying Air Canada, giving us more flexibility on where to go. Now that's just the passenger side, but airlines also win big, mainly through greater revenue upside and reliability and the aforementioned benefits of offering a better passenger experience, which surely has to be important in this day and age. We'll stick with that last example of Air Canada and Florida to demonstrate the revenue upside. The flip side of having passengers connect through Orlando is that Air Canada can take that existing capacity to other cities in Florida and redeploy it to focus on Orlando, using it as a de facto hub with Brightline. This reduces schedule complexity and opens up exciting opportunities for upgaging to larger, more efficient aircraft. I think running 787s to Orlando instead of A321s, or using those slots for longer haul flights. Now take this concept and multiply it across the entire route network. Airlines will have more flexibility with their slots at busy airports, allowing them to utilize their fleet in the highest yield markets. On the reliability side, system reliability should increase because rail is more reliable than air under these circumstances. It's important to make the distinction here. I'm not saying that rail is always more reliable, but for the use cases we're talking about, such as not switching trains, likely high-speed rail from a large terminus, trains tend to see fewer delays despite higher schedule frequency. Back to Deutsche Bahn. Since they're leading the whole concept, their on-time statistics for long-distance routes are currently around 75%, which means that one in four trains are arriving more than six minutes late. That honestly doesn't sound very good, but take a guess at the statistics for Air Canada in 2019. Pre-COVID, north of 30% of Air Canada's flights were delayed by 15 minutes or more. 15 minutes, not 6. WestJet was comparatively better, with only 22% of their flights seeing such delays. Deutsche Bahn, with their supposedly horrible punctuality, blows airlines out of the water. If North America could reach Deutsche Bahn levels of service, then airlines could improve their networks while covering operational failures with rail. Finally, we have the largest but quietest stakeholder of them all, the environment. One of the main reasons why air rail as a concept is so far along is because of sustainability reasons, even if it's 50% PR and 50% hot air. Carbon is the elephant in the room for all airlines, something that I touched on extensively in my A220 videos. You can check them out here. Aircraft are unlikely to be viably net zero carbon for at least one more decade, and especially not long haul aircraft. Whether you like it or not, electrified trains will gain more traction as a clean replacement for aircraft trips under 1,000 kilometers. I know, you need to do the life cycle analysis and electrify the grid for trains to be actually sustainable, but it's still far cleaner than flying. This is worth explaining in detail. Flights are bad for the environment, largely due to emissions, but short flights are even worse. There are extremely high carbon costs on takeoff, especially on the climb to cruising altitude. So when you think about it, short flights, you still have the takeoff portion, that's almost like a fixed cost that isn't going away. Take this flight on an A330 from LA to Paris, for example. It burns 3,700 pounds of fuel during the first six minutes of climb, and the total climb takes 28 minutes and 13,000 pounds of fuel, coming to an hourly rate of around 28,000 pounds of fuel. The total fuel used in this flight was 142,000 pounds, so the remaining 10 hours or so burnt 129,000 pounds of fuel, giving an hourly burn of around 13,000. That's a burn rate of 28,000 on climb versus 13,000 on cruising. Fuel intensive low altitude operations make the efficiency of short flights disproportionately poor. Imagine if that A330 went from LA to New York instead of Paris. That 13,000 pounds of fuel on climb doesn't change, increasing the proportional impact of that segment on the entire flight's emissions. Now using a smaller aircraft as an example, 
the 737-800 might burn less fuel due to its lower weight. But with a consumption of 5,000 pounds for 30 minutes of takeoff and climb, compared to a burn rate of 5,000 pounds per hour of cruising, that low altitude operation is still around twice as energy intensive as cruising. There's no way around it. Takeoff and climb takes a lot of energy, which disproportionately affects the impact of short flights. On the flip side, electrified trains are far better for the environment. Take the trip from London to Madrid. One of Ryanair's 737-800s will pump out over 115 kilograms of CO2 per passenger, whereas the trip on an electrified Eurostar and TGV emits just over 40 kilograms. Not perfect, but immensely better. And electrification means the potential to reach zero operational emissions if and when the grid is actually cleaned up with renewables. But, and this is a big but, trains are not automatically better than planes. This distinction has to be made because the only thing worse than harming the environment is harming the environment but thinking that you're helping. Many of Canada's own domestic train routes are actually worse for the environment than flying is, or at the very least, not much cleaner. Can you guess why? Not only does Via Rail exclusively use diesel-powered locomotives that aren't particularly efficient, but they're not full of passengers either. With an average load factor of 60% in 2019, yep, that's pre-COVID, these behemoths are hauling around a lot of empty seats. And that's not even factoring in the natural dead space of dining cars and other train equipment. Now throw in how passenger trains have to wait for freight trains on the Canadian rail network, and you get a method of transport that isn't remotely cleaner than flying on certain routes. With that being said, electrified high-speed rail is far more efficient than flying. The Eurostar has an average emission factor of 6 grams of carbon dioxide per passenger kilometer, compared to a global average of 144 grams for aviation. Now that we know what air rail alliances are, and I've definitely convinced you of their merit, here comes the fun part, looking where we can actually put these things. And this might honestly be more important than the nitty gritty of how it works, because this is the part that gets people excited, and things will only happen if people get excited. We'll first look at where air rail alliances are in use today, and then we'll explore potential markets where this can be introduced in the future. There are seven railways and 10 airlines that run dedicated air rail alliances the railways all being European, except for the Chinese HSR. KLM's partnership with Talus is interesting because of the high degree of integration between air and rail, at least in theory, providing an exemplar for other schemes. For several years, KLM has offered the option to connect between Amsterdam and Brussels by a Talus high-speed train, with nearly a quarter of KLM's passengers choosing this option pre-COVID. I take that to mean KLM's passengers on this route. Both companies are now re-upping efforts to have rail fully replace air on this route, announcing plans for automatic itinerary integration, reserved seats, and bag checking on train-plane connections. This route is almost tailor-made for high-speed rail, with the trip taking under two hours and getting you right into Brussels Midi in the city center. It almost always comes out quicker than the 45 minutes by flying when you factor in traveling to and from the airport, that whole spiel about productive time at the airport that we talked about earlier. The other example I'll talk about doesn't actually exist anymore, but it's extremely relevant for North America. From 2002 to 2020, Amtrak had a code share agreement at Newark with Continental and then United after that merger. It was honestly pretty ahead of its time with connections up and down the eastern seaboard, creating a much more pleasant experience on overseas trips into destinations like 30th Street in Philadelphia. Around a decade into the arrangement, around 24,000 people were connecting between Amtrak and United via Newark with 90% of them originating in Philadelphia. People seem to really like it, so it should come as no surprise that the whole thing was axed in early 2021. We'll never know 100% why this happened, but it was likely a combination of financial pressure from COVID and rampant abuse of the system. You see, not only could you gain mileage points from both companies, but tickets involving both train and plane were sometimes cheaper, opening up opportunities for ghost ticketing or hidden city ticketing, whatever you want to call it. A super quick explanation, there's this blog post explaining how a flight from Vegas to Newark and then taking a train to Philadelphia, so that's a total trip from Vegas to Philly, was actually cheaper than a direct flight from Vegas to Newark. Given that there was no way of verifying whether you actually made it on the Amtrak leg, you could just book the Vegas to Philly trip and never get on the train. This of course makes the whole thing less financially viable, and when you factor in COVID, maybe that's why they took it away. 
So there were clearly some issues with the system, but it still worked in North America for over two decades. So it's not like the concept is impossible to run here. If you haven't noticed already, this arrangement tends to work best with the following criteria. One, routes between a hub and a non-hub. This lets airlines funnel traffic into one location and send passengers off to smaller destinations on rail. Two, rail-friendly geography. Pretty self-explanatory because it's hard to lay high-speed rail tracks over a mountain. And three, ideally around 400 kilometers apart or flight time of an hour, a similar distance between Toronto and Ottawa. Rail comes out on top for these distances because the dead time of airports means that both journeys take a similar amount of time, but trains are much better for productivity and sustainability. And comfort, I guess. With that being said, here are some examples where this could work in North America. Orlando and Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, or Miami. This might be the most realistic of the list because Florida actually has a functioning rail network that could be considered high speed if you squint hard enough. Brightline already links Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm Beach, but is expected to launch a link right into Orlando International Airport by early 2023. We already talked about how non-US players like Air Canada can enter into an alliance with Brightline and suddenly serve the whole of Florida just by flying into Orlando and using it as a hub. I'm bringing it up here again because I really want to see it happen. Dallas-Fort Worth, an AA hub, and Austin. This is geared towards American Airlines, naturally, because they basically own Dallas-Fort Worth. Austin, on the other hand, isn't dominated by any single US carrier. Factor in the high traffic between the two cities, the one hour flight time, and the geography of Texas, you end up with an ideal city pairing. Calgary and Edmonton. These two cities still don't have a high speed rail corridor. Surprise. Leaving us with a 53 minute flight instead. Air rail here would also open up some interesting options for ultra low cost carriers like Flair or Swoop, who would suddenly be able to serve both cities from one airport. Montreal to Quebec City. A seamless link from Montreal would help open up Quebec City to more tourism. Not much else to say here. Finally, Vancouver and Seattle. I'm just throwing out any market that works at this point. Either Vancouver or Seattle could be deemed the hub here, but the rail link means that domestic US players like Alaska Airlines, headquartered in Seattle, could tap into Vancouver's cruise market without having to leave the country. There are so many more places where this could and should be viable. All we have to do is build it. To me, air rail alliances are one of those things that just make sense. You're using the optimal form of transportation for specific distances. But my goal isn't to convince you to see it the same way. My goal is to simply shed light on the topic and to show people what's possible. It might not mean anything in the end, but if there's just one more person who wants it now, then it'll be that much more likely to happen. Thanks for watching.